Welcome to Families for Life with Brian and Brian, a podcast of Oak Hill Baptist Church. On this week's episode, we're going to be talking about our Christmas special, part one. Oh, you hear the, those bells? What does that mean? Christmas time is here, officially. Santa is on the roof, ready Santa? to bring presents. Who's that? <laughs> Who's <Santa? laughs> well, folks, we're back, and uh, we had a great Thanksgiving, yeah. but now I'm in the Christmas spirit. Have yes. you been listening to Christmas music? I definitely have. I've been listening to the Christmas music for a long time already, Brian. <laughs> I got my lights up. We haven't done the inside yet. We're going to work on that this weekend, but I got my lights up outside before the weather turned cold. That's very smart because we did the opposite and now I don't want to put my lights <laughs> yeah, out. <laughs> exactly. But I'm in the Christmas spirit and I know we want to talk about Christmas for the next two episodes because it's a big part of things that we both like Christmas a lot. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's a big part of church and everything. So that's right. Yeah. Thought it'd be huge, good to talk about it. Huge part of the Christian faith is yeah. Christmas. So yeah. So yeah, I guess let, we want to talk a little bit about just our own experience. This week we're really talking about just kind of the the church and understanding Christmas and and things like that and the historical background a little bit of that. Next week we want to talk about how we as families can celebrate Christmas right. um, well. And so, but but let's talk about yeah. our experience in the church, just kind of like our church, you know, maybe traditions or whatever that we grew up with. Yeah. So one of my fondest memories is, you know, growing up, uh, we would visit my family in Arkansas, mm -hmm. my grandparents and uh, aunts and uncles and, and whatnot. And we always went to church together at my grandparents' church. And it was that candlelight service, you yeah. know, at night. We'd uh, eat dinner, go to church, you know, be be with family. And that was just a really great memory. Uh, you know, as a kid, I can't really like point out necessarily like any of the messages or anything, but I do know like we lit candles, we sang spiritual Christmas carol type yeah. songs. Yeah. And uh, that was just a really great memory that I have. And I really tie that to my grandparents. So my grandfather passed away. My, my grandmother is in a nursing home. So we haven't done that in several years, but uh, it's just a great memory that I have and love that that's tied to church. Yeah, no, that I think that's awesome because similarly, a lot of my memories come from, you know, being with my grandparents and going to church with them around Christmas time and, and just singing the, singing the songs, singing the, the songs about Christ and him coming to the world. And, uh, you know, I, I growing up, we ended up actually being, in, we moved around some, and so I was a part of several different churches, and I got to see how several different churches kind of celebrated, all very similar, but but different, unique things mm -hmm. that were a part, but just the the music, you know, was huge, right. and, and it's not just music, it's not like just fluff, it was like deep, theological, meaningful music right. that just really, like you said, I don't remember messages so much as I remember the words and songs. Right that are just, they still, uh, speak to me, uh, today. So, yeah, it is neat that you know, a lot of our growing up is tied to church, you know, when, yeah. and, and especially at Christmas, I, I, I think that if your Christmas is not have some sort of influence of church or of Christ, you know, there's definitely something lost, something missing there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think people who don't get to experience being in church at Christmas time, really just don't experience the fullness of what Christmas is. Right. You know, it's it's just presents. It's just Santa Claus. It's just this. And it's so much more than that. That's right. So, so let's right. jump into this a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do kind of, I guess, so you and I both have looked up different aspects of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So let's talk about the biblical and theological underpinning, because I really think there's some important things that we need to discuss, you know, we, we kind of can gloss over some of these things, but man, Christmas has some really significant theological points. That's right. So yeah. what did you, what did you, what did you research here? Yeah. And so the, the main things that I was looking into are essentially just, first of all, the importance of the holiday. Like mm. why, 
why is this important? Uh, why do we celebrate this? Uh, because, you know, a lot of, I even hear people argue that like, oh, you shouldn't celebrate Christmas as much because Easter is the most important thing. The fact that Jesus died and was resurrected. And I'm like, I fully agree. Right. Easter, you know, that, I mean, that's the gospel that Jesus well, and Christians died didn't, for our sins. Christians did not always... Uh, celebrate the birth of Christ from right. early on. It wasn't until a couple of centuries later after that it started. But right. I think that came from a need to really understand Heighten these it. theological points well, and celebrate them. And that's the thing as they were coming to realization of certain theological aspects, right. they, they had to, to really fight for what the Bible actually said. They started celebrating what the Bible actually said. And right. so the first thing is, is this idea of Advent, this, this, this idea of arrival. Advent means arrival, and that's really what Christmas is. It's celebrating the arrival of Christ into his creation. Mm. He is the creator of the world, and he came into his creation. So he didn't become he didn't start existing at Christmas time. Mm. He had always existed and he simply became a part of his own creation. That's what John 1, 1 through 3 and 14 says. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. All things came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And here's verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Mm. This is John's account of Christmas. This is how John explains right. Christmas. Jesus is from everlasting, and he is God, and he was with God, right. and he created. Jesus being the word, the logos, That's the right. living word, came and dwelt among us. And I think that you know, in and of itself is so significant. You look at so many religions and the, the God stands outside and That's never right. has a personal touch. But just like the Bible says in other places, God cares about our very needs and he cares about our very souls. And he came to earth to do something about our lost condition. That's right. Well, and that's the whole idea behind Jesus and his name of Emmanuel and right. God with us is mm -hmm. Jesus came to be with us. He didn't just make us to be servants and he didn't just uh, make us to simply save us. He saves us so that we can be with him and he with us. And that's so that's the thing that a lot of times we lose sight of. Like Christmas isn't just looking back. It actually mm -hmm. is something that should make us look forward. And this is what I get from Titus 2, mm -hmm. 11 through 13. It says, for the grace of God has appeared. And that word appeared is that idea of arrival, this advent. He showed up, right? And he brought salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the, here it is again, appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Right. So this right here tells us, Christmas happened. Jesus arrived, and he brought salvation to us, and he instructs us now on how to live in that salvation. And in this time, we look forward to the next Advent. Mm. We're celebrating the fact that he came and that he is coming again. Right. And so that is why you know Christmas is huge. It's so important because it's this first arrival and his return that makes salvation so good. It's yeah. about being with God. Yeah. Yeah, I really uh, think that that's one of the most significant things about it. You know, there's another significant thing is the fact that prophecy is involved in this. So the birth of Christ validates the scriptures, uh, you know, in another way, N not as if they're not already valid, but it brings more validation to scriptures because there's so much prophecy revolving around Christ's birth. And then we see it fulfilled in this way. So you you see the a bridge between the old and the new and how how this really is the Messiah. This there's is no yes. other there's indisputable evidence that this is the Messiah. That's right. And this is funny. I so as I was doing some research, I came across an article written by Derek Thomas mm -hmm. and um he he starts talking about the fact that the number 7 is the number of perfection in the Bible. It's the idea that when the Bible does something in sevens, it's saying this is 100%. This is perfect. This is all you need sort of thing. And then he goes and says, Matthew, in his account of Jesus's birth, actually does this. He has seven 
prophecies that he references in the fulfillment of Christ. And so the point that Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, he's making the point, this is 100% yeah. the Messiah. He, he In Matthew 1, 22 and 23, the virgin birth, that's Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9. Matthew 2, 5 and 6, the, the Bethlehem, uh, the city of Bethlehem, that's Micah 5, 2. Matthew 2.15 and his flight to Egypt, that fulfills Hosea 11.1. Matthew 2.17-18 and the slaughter of innocents uh, fulfills Jeremiah 31.15. Uh, it, it goes on and on through uh, the reference to him being a Nazarene, this idea of being of a lowly estate the prophets talked about. Matthew 3, 1 through uh, 3, John the Baptist, Isaiah 40 through 3. Matthew 4, 13 through 14, his ministry starts in Galilee. The light shines in the darkness, is fulfilling Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. The point being, this is the Messiah. Right. And if you don't get that, then you're just not paying attention. Right. Yeah. And there's even more prophecies than that. I mean, there's there's too many to get into. So many. I just think it's so important that we kind of pull this out because... Uh, there's confirmation. It's, it's, it's another confirmation of Jesus, his divinity, and, uh, really just points to him being our savior. Well, and here's the thing, you know, a lot of people like to say, Hey, you know, you know, you're a Christian cause you grew up in church sort of thing. They say that right. kind of stuff to me. And, uh, and I like to say to them, no, that's not why, because, uh, I actually have really considered this. And one of the interesting things is as you look at all other religious figures in the world, um, none of them, none of them were foretold. Right. None of them fulfill prophet. They just popped out of nowhere. Jesus didn't pop out of nowhere. We've been, God has been preparing us for this the whole time. Mm-hmm. And, and so this is, this has been told and then it came about all these other Buddha, Muhammad, uh, Joseph Smith, and everyone else you can look at. They just came out of nowhere. There's no no prophecy, no nothing. There's nothing to right. validate this. Jesus is so so truly the Messiah. It's it's unbelievable right. how perfect God did this. Right. So that's why it's just amazing. As we celebrate Christmas, we should be overwhelmed by mm-hmm. God's uh, foresight and His right. planning, just so that He could rescue us. Yeah, it's amazing. That's yes. That's. That's exactly right. You know, there's another uh, part of this that can be perceived as controversial. You know, there are several controversial things in the life of Christ. Not controversial from my perspective, because I believe the scriptures, but scholars, especially liberal scholars and people that don't hold to God's word, they, they, uh, they doubt the resurrection, they doubt Jesus' miracles, those kind of things. But they also doubt the virgin birth. They love to doubt the virgin birth. And this is so important that we hold fast to this doctrine. Why do you, why is this such an important doctrine that Christians must understand this and must hold fast to this? Well, and that's a big question that people like to ask is, if you're a Christian, do you have to believe this? Um, and so I, I think you and I would both clearly say, yes, it, to be a Christian, you have to believe this. And first of all, it's, it's mainly because, you know, the Bible clearly says it. Matthew and Luke both plainly tell us that Jesus was conceived by a virgin, and Christians have throughout history affirmed that the Bible is true. Jesus was born of a virgin. And so what that doesn't mean, it does not mean that Mary was sinless and God just, you know, used the sinless Mary in order to bring about the sinless Christ. It doesn't mean that. Um, It doesn't mean that God, you know, removed Joseph from the scene uh, so that, you know, because I've heard heard it said that males, uh, you know, human men are the only ones who actually transmit the original sin. And it's like, no, actually all human beings have original sin. And so it's not that it was only males. Um, that's not what that means. Yeah. We have inherited sin nature from the beginning from Adam that's and right. Eve. That that's all, right. All people are, are sinful. Are sinful. There's none of us have a hope aside from Christ. Right. And so, but what this does show us is it is very significant. And I found this from a Desiring God article is that uh, humanity needs saving that it can't produce for itself. So the point that is being that God is making in this uh, virgin birth is that human beings could not come up with a person by ourselves who could save us. 
It has to be someone from the outside, but it also has to be somebody on the inside. And the only way to make that happen is for for this person to be fully God and fully man. And so the virgin birth makes that happen. It shows that God is the one who took initiative to save. This was an interesting point that uh, this article made, is that God didn't ask Mary uh, if, if she would want to do this, and he didn't ask anybody if they wanted a Savior. He just said, hey, you're going to you're gonna end up pregnant here right. soon. Um, and he did it gently, but he did it decisively. And right. that, was, that was good. God is in control of this, and he made this happen. Right. Um, but it really shows this supernatural reality. Mm-hmm. The, the supernatural world is real, right. and God is in control of it all. And this points to the fact that Jesus is fully God and fully human. Right, right. And, and that and, is key. That is key right there. Right. So did you want to say something yeah, about no, that? Yeah, I no, just, I just think that Christians have to, we have to come to terms with this and believe that this is a supernatural event and occurrence that that... Uh, Jesus was born of a virgin. And, you know, the Bible tells us this very clearly. It's in scripture. Uh, It's foretold Mm -hmm. in prophecy. And so this is something that we must believe because it impacts our, our gospel on the other side. So to know that God, uh, that Jesus, a sinless, uh, you know, divine man died for, died for us. Yeah. He was the only perfect spotless lamb that could have that could have had that sacrifice. That's right. So the beginning of his life impacts the end of his life. And it's so significant in what we believe about the gospel that if we do not have the virgin birth, we really can't have the gospel. Well, and here's a, that's a hundred percent true, Brian. And the, the other thing about this that people just don't think about is if, if you are, the only way to be saved is to believe that that Jesus died for our sins and that God raised him from the dead. That's Romans 10, that God raised him from the dead, okay? Is it really harder for you to believe that there was a virgin birth, or is it harder to believe that God raised a man from the dead? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, if we believe that Jesus came back to life, then surely I can believe that God made Mary pregnant without her being with a man. So this is not hard. It's really a question of faith. Right. And if we don't have faith, then we cannot be saved. Right. That's why mm-hmm. this is so important. Right. And so we have to believe in the the truth of the Bible and the gospel right. in order to know uh, God fully. That's right. So that's just kind of a basic kind of kind of background. You know, there's a lot of historical things that I find really interesting. Yeah, you know, like yeah. I said, I'm excited to hear some of this. Christians did not have Christmas on the calendar until about three hundred yeah. Uh, AD, you know, around that time, this was not something that was celebrated in any sort of like regular worldwide Christian thing for right. a couple of centuries, uh, <clears throat> which I find, you know, very fascinating, and interesting, but it, it came up really as, as uh, a need to solidify our faith in Christ and some of these doctrines, you know? Yeah. You know, Christmas is inevitably always tied to Santa Claus. Yes. Uh, You know, that's a big part. And I think we need to kind of maybe dissect one of the big things about the Christian tradition is there really was a a, a St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas. There was a St. Nicholas. Now, here's here's the interesting thing. We cannot verify many of the accounts of his life. Right. There was a man. He was he was (laughs) he was a bishop. Uh, You know, he was born in in what is now modern day Turkey around 280, he became a bishop, uh, in Myra, which is also modern day Turkey, but there's so many legends surrounding him. He was told to be a wonder worker who brought children back to life. He destroyed pagan temples. He saved sailors from death at sea. Uh, as an infant, this one I find hilarious. He, he nursed only two days a week and fasted the other five days. <laughs> a very <What>? holy baby. <laughs> what? Uh, all this stuff is probably exaggerated or, or untrue, but we can say for certain that he was a man who faced persecution mm-hmm. under Diocletian and Maximum, uh, the, those Roman rulers. You know, this was a, a big part of the Christians that lived during yeah, this they time. they all suffered. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and so there's... There is one really cool story that I love that I hope is true yes. because it's my most favorite. At the Council of Nicaea, they were considering the deity of Christ. Right. Uh, and 
uh, many people bought into Arianism, which was espoused by Arius, that Jesus was not the same substance as God, right. that thus he was being less than God, making Jesus a created being. And really the outworking that is our entire Trinitarian theology falls apart. Which is clearly just not what the Bible teaches. Right. I mean, you look at Hebrews, you look at Romans, you look at everywhere, and it's so clearly not the case. Right. So they were fighting against this, and here comes St. Nicholas, well, right? Well, really, Athanasius was the real hero. Oh, okay. okay. So I want people to understand that Athanasius was the one who fought against Arian and Arianism. That's right. That's and there's right. an excellent sermon by John Piper on Desiring God website on the life of Athanasius that people need to listen to. He fought vehemently for the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Um, this is that homo, what is it? A homo usios. Yeah, right. Yeah. Those Versus really the fancy homo words. usios. Right. One, it's literally a, an iota. <laughs> right. One eye that caused the Changes the entire meeting. Yep. And so he fought that Jesus was the same substance as God with God in the beginning, all those types of things that we believe now. Now, the legend is St. Nicholas became so frustrated with Arius <laughs> that he punched him or slapped him in the face during the Council of Nicaea. He loved Jesus. He, Jesus is God. Well, bam! <laughs> right. So he almost was removed as bishop. But as the legend goes, Jesus and Mary appeared and stopped at, at the council and stopped all that from happening. So this is oh. where there's probably more legend yeah, than so. fact here. But... <laughs> Uh, Arius was a heretic and that means we should punch all heretics. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but I love the no. fact that you get big, San big, tough Santa Claus that, that punched a guy for yeah. not. Yeah. Santa Claus isn't this, Jesus. you know, rosy little rosy cheeked, you know, little guy. He's, he's uh rough and tough and he he's loves macho. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so St. Nicholas was a generous giver. He was born into a wealthy family, but gave most of his fortune away. And there's one story, uh, again, we don't know if it's true, but he secretly paid the dowry for three young women yes. so they could get married and avoid the, a life of prostitution. I think that's the second kind of biggest story about him right. that people know. Yeah. Right. Now, over time, the legend grew and churches were named for him. People claimed them as his patron saint. In Germany and the Netherlands, St. Nicholas became the patron, patron saint of children. And this led to the idea of secretly giving gifts to children on December 6th, which was his feast day, right. St. Nicholas feast day. And so from that, we get our modern tradition of Santa Claus. Right. Well, and you know what Santa Claus, I, I, maybe everybody else just gets this right away, but it, it didn't dawn on me for a while that Santa Claus is, is literally, it's a translation from like the German and Dutch. Mm. Santa is Saint and Claus or Klaus mm -hmm. is Nikolaus. Mm. So Santa Claus is Saint, Saint Nicholas. Nicholas. Yep. And so it's really yeah. interesting. A lot of this stuff comes to us from those traditions right, exactly. in those regions. Yes. And we're going to talk more about Santa Claus next week, especially how to handle that with right. your kids. Family. But I do want to point this out that we need to remember that Jesus needs to be the center of the holiday and not Santa Claus. Amen. And so... I'm sure that uh, if we could talk to St. Nicholas today, he would not want the spotlight shown on him. He might he would, smack you in the face. He would want it to focus on Jesus. That's right. Right? He would want it to focus on Jesus. So we have to remember that first. We're going to get into a little more nuances of that, but mm -hmm. that's enough to just leave that there. So. Right. But let's talk about it, some Christmas myths. Yeah, there's a lot of other stuff that comes into this, and uh, we we really got to deal with some of these things. There's especially a lot of stuff that you'll see posted on social media about you know uh, different different ideas of where Christmas came from. Right. So, Brian, you've done the research on this. Tell us yeah, a little bit about that. Well, let's talk about the date of Christmas first. Uh, yeah. Our celebrating on December 25th does not align with the historical date of when Jesus came. It, he probably was born in the springtime, March, April, May, sometime in that, that, but no one knows for sure. That's, That's right. the thing. We, that was thousands of years ago. No one knows for sure. We get December 25th from the Roman Christians in 336 AD. They speculated the conception of Jesus was March 25th. Thus going forward nine months. So, March 25th was the date he was thought to be born and crucified. Right. On or the conceived same day. And, and crucified. Yeah, I'm sorry. Conceived yep. and crucified. Once again, probably... That, that was just probably made Probably more up. myth. People just made that up. More, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
But anyway, nine months, you get December 25th. So there's no way to verify these days. And to me, Brian, it's not really that important. Right. People get really torqued up about this. We're it's put a date on the calendar. We're celebrating it. It's more significant that we are celebrating it than we get the date right. Well, and it's really important to know too, like if we're going to apply the same uh, principles to understanding history to Jesus, as we do to anyone else in history, there are like most of the significant historical figures in the world. They don't know the exact date that they were born. Right. So it's okay that we don't know exactly when he was born because we know what happened during his life. Right. We do know that. We know Jesus was born. Yes. We know, we know the gospel is true. All the accounts in the Bible. And that's, that's enough for us. That's all we me. need. Yeah, that's right. You know, some thought that we picked December 25th to replace a pagan holiday Saturnalia. around that same time. Yeah. But there's really not significant evidence to back this up. There wasn't like a, 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 cons- a conspiracy that Christians said, we're going to take over this pagan holiday. Yeah. I, mean, I would even say onto that there, I've, I've seen that and, uh, and I've looked into that some, and there are some really good resources out there, especially on like YouTube that, that do a really good job of debunking that. And yeah. they use source, uh, texts. Yeah. So they, they're citing source texts. They're not just making stuff up. They're telling, you no, here is how this actually played out. Right. So you can find that right. out there. So then also, uh, another myth about Christmas is kind of what we believe that the Bible says, but the Bible really doesn't, doesn't say. say. <laughs> and so these are my favorite. <laughs> we just have to be careful. You know, I, I, there's a great uh, together for the gospel article that kind of summarizes this and it, it gives us a couple things. So despite the impression giving by many nativity plays and Christmas carols, the Bible does <sighs> yeah. not specify that Mary rode a donkey. Yep. What? That's insane. Uh, I even watched a show with with my son the other day about the the small one donkey. Exactly. Like, that's not real? That uh, the Bible does not specify that the innkeeper turned Mary and Joseph away, only that there was no room at the inn. That um, Mary gave birth to Jesus the day she arrived in Bethlehem, only that it happened while they were there. I had never thought of that, actually, but it it really doesn't say that it happened immediately after they got there. Yeah, that's a good point. That the angels sang... They only spoke and they pray. It says they praised God. We don't know right. exactly how that right was. was they might have sung. They might have, but it doesn't say right. they definitely sang. Right. That there were three wise men. No number is specified. Oh, man. That's the one that gets me. That one in this next one you're about and to then say. That the Magi arrived on the day or the night of Jesus' birth. In right. fact, it was probably a couple years later. Jesus was a toddler at the time because it coincided when Herod was killing all the males two, two right. years and under. That's so, right. Well, I've heard people, I, I can't remember who it was, but they told me that they would always, whenever they found a nativity scene that had the Magi, they would always take the Magi and place put it them across the room really far yeah. away. Yeah. <laughs> They're on their way. <laughs> put the wise men in the other room. That's right. They're coming. It's just going to be a little bit. <laughs> and that Jesus was born in a stable. Uh, right. It doesn't say that. It does say Mary placed him in a, in a manger, in a manger. which is a food trough that, right. that animals would eat out of. Uh, but it could have been a cave, a shelter. It could have been in a house. We, we just don't know for sure. Right. But it exactly. definitely wasn't nice. That's yeah, kind of the yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It think was kind of right. shabby. Yeah. And so I think we just have to be careful and don't add more to scripture than what is actually what there. That's right. It's nice to think these things. And, and I'm okay to have a little bit of a sanctified imagination to right. fill in some of the details. But we got to make sure we don't overstep what scripture says. Well, that's so like for me, here's a perfect example of how to do this. So like I, this, this might be weird, but I really like the little drummer boy, that old claymation, uh, you know, movie. And Wait, the little drummer boy is not real. Uh, d- d- <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> no, but yeah, I really like that, 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 uh, it's, I guess it's a movie. It's really short and I watch it, you know, I watch it as a kid, but I've always known that that wasn't real, but there's a message that's being, Right. You know, spoken through that. And it's the message that we can say, yeah, that is true. And that is a part of Christmas. Right. Um, Even though this isn't necessarily like biblical. That's right. And so we have to think about it that way. Pa-rum, pum, pum, pum. Yeah, it's so good. (laughs) Hey, so Martin Luther also brings a role to some of these modern traditions. You know, Martin Luther, the patron saint of Protestants, um, that was a joke, by the way. I was, I was like, I was like, I don't see that in the notes. <laughs> so the Catholics attributed gift giving to Saint Nicholas, like we discussed, right? 
Yeah. Well, Martin Luther made gift giving on Christmas Eve a part of their tradition, but he told his children that Jesus brought the gifts. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really important. So this caught on with Lutherans, but mm-hmm. as time passed, even Protestants started giving credit to Saint Nick, just not just Catholics. That. Yeah, yeah, he couldn't overcome that. Yeah, but I, think we I will say that in our world too. Yeah. One cool thing about Lu- about Luther is that he's credited as the first person to decorate a Christmas tree yep. with lights. He was walking home from church one night and saw the the stars twinkling through the evergreens. Yeah. And wanted to recreate that, so he put a tree in his in his living room with candles mm-hmm. all on it for his family. I thought that was really Which, neat, and that that's amazing because that actually debunks another myth that people think that this was mm-hmm. a pagan thing where right. people would bring in wreaths and stuff, and that might have happened. But but the reality, this actually came from Martin Luther right. uh, saying, "Hey, this is a beautiful representation of God's nature and right. the stars, and I'm going to put that in my house." Right, and so that's that's a pretty cool thing. I love that. So, and the final myth that I want to bring up, this is my personal soapbox, Brian. Mm. I, uh, I step up on that. Can't stand <laughs> when Christians, uh, get upset about Xmas. Yes. So I used to, I used to get super mad about that too. So, so people so. will write Xmas. They don't usually say X. Nobody says Xmas. Right. They mostly say Christmas, but they'll write X and then M-A-S. Um, yep. And people will say, you're taking Christ out of Christmas as if you're Xing out Christ. Christ. Right. Now, some people may mean it as that, but historically, for the most part, this is simply a shorthand because X represents the Greek letter in the, in the Greek alphabet of Chi. Yeah. So they do this also when they're saying Christ right. or or Christians or things like that. Well, and that that key or Chi is the first letter of, of Christ uh, in right. Greek, Christus. Right. And so it's actually... It's really meaningful right. when you put that there. Well, it's the same thing. You might see another Greek shorthand is the O with the line through it for for theos, yes. you know, for God. Yes, yes, yes. It's not it's not changing anything. It's you're writing these things so much that yep. you're abbreviating them. It's a lot like the ichthus, the the fish symbol right. that mm-hmm. people have. It's the same concept as that. And so that's one of the things that Christians did. But yeah, no, I really was. I when I was younger, I would get so mad when I saw Xmas. So if you don't want to use Xmas, that's fine. But don't get on other people. Right, right that use it because they may just mean it as a shorthand. Well, and ask them, you know, like, hey, did you know what that means? And find out. Because if they don't know what it means, hey, tell them. Tell them what it actually means. That'll be a good conversation starter. So So those are some of our Christmas myths. Uh, But, you know, one of the important things that the church gets to do is really drive some of the Christmas traditions and really keep the focus. You know, I see our church and my job as a minister to put the Christmas focus on Jesus yeah, and to say, okay, church, let's use this as an opportunity to uh, disciple our families, to reorient our lives and our minds back on Jesus. And I think that's what the church can really do and help in that time. Do you agree with that? I fully agree with that. And I know for my own self, I need that. You know, I need the church to be you know, really focusing on the fact that Jesus came to be with us, God with us. I need that. And so I know, I know I'm not alone in that. I hope I'm not. And uh, so, yeah, it's our job to really focus that in. And so we've got several ways that we try right. to do that. The the one that we're doing this year um, with our student families and our ki- kids' families is uh, we've given out the God with us devotional mm-hmm. made by YM360. And it's a 25 day devotional just to just a short something every day to just get your mind on Christ and and what he did in coming to the so earth. So we emailed that out to everyone. That's right. In our church family. Yep. We have hard copies available, but mm-hmm. that's just a great way to 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 do that. We also I like to do something. I have a, yes. a Christmas the last few years. Actually, I got this from the old children's director mm-hmm. April Sharp. Got to give her a shout out. Oh yeah. But we do the cake uh, mix giveaway. And what it is, it's a devotional with cake mix and frosting and a single candle mm-hmm. that with your families, you can do this devotional and have a birthday party for Jesus. Yeah. So this is fun for little kids, especially mm-hmm. because it helps them to think, okay, this is what we're celebrating Jesus's birth. So yes. every year we sing happy birthday to it's Jesus. A birthday party. Yeah, yeah. It's a birthday party. And so that's just a great reminder for the, especially for the little ones, to put that focus oh, yeah. on Jesus. That's a huge way. And so another thing, and this is one that I, I mean, all throughout my life, th- this 
was an impactful thing in my life and my family's life is a Christmas Eve service. Yes. And so we have a Christmas Eve service. Uh, what do we call it? It's carols. Candles and communion. Thank you. And uh, and so we we sing Christmas carols. We, we have the candlelight service, and we actually uh, participate in communion together. Yeah. I love um, the simplicity of it. I love the... Uh, it's just kind of really stripped down. Yeah. You know, the, the band is usually smaller, and it's really focused... The focus is on the it's Lord. All on Jesus. And it's great. I love yes, it. it. So is yeah, so make meaningful. this a part. I would really challenge you, uh, wherever you're at, to find a church. If you're in our area, come to our church. Find a Christmas Eve service to participate in if you are. If you can't find one online, right. if, if you're not able to be in person right now. But man, it's just so meaningful and impact to mark your face. Like we are making Christmas Eve a priority. That's right. We're going to be at church at Christmas Eve because Jesus is that important to us. Yes, absolutely. And that was one of the things about this, you know, Christmas. I, I just want to throw this in really fast. Christmas started as a worship service on Christmas day. Right. Could you imagine getting up in the morning on Christmas day and not running around the tree, but instead going right. to church? Right. That's what people did. So we can do this on Christmas Eve and it really matters. That's it's right. so impactful. Yeah, we also there's have, other stuff. You know, yeah. we also have like a Christmas night of worship that we're doing. Yes, uh, that yes. our worship ministry is doing. We have sermon series. You know, we do all these things to focus on Jesus. That's right. But I also think that the church encourages giving and serving to others. You know, we'll right. do special offerings. Yep. We'll do special things like we have our angel tree that helps benefit our food pantry families for yeah. to give out gifts in our community. And you may think, why do these, why do these kids need gifts? That's not a, that's not a necessity. You're right. It's not a necessity. Like food is a necessity, which we also give out, but you know, it's one way that we can share the love of Christ. You know, God is a generous gift giver. No, he does not just give us the necessity, the, ne the, the necessary grace. It's right. overflowing grace. And so I think it's a great way to represent God's lavish gifts to us to say, listen, we're going to give you more than what you need. That's right. I and mean, so to have a kid yeah. wake up to a gift on Christmas that may or may not have something or have very little, this, this could mean a lot to them. It absolutely, it absolutely means a lot. And I, I know I, one of my pastors growing up would always tell a story of how one Christmas when he was a kid, their house caught fire and mm. burned and they lost all of their Christmas presents, mm. everything. They lost it all. And truckers who were driving nearby would tell the story uh, of, of how this house got burned down and these kids weren't going to have any Christmas presents. And these truckers all came together and they bought tons of presents for this, wow. for my pastor and, and gave them Christmas presents. And that is like, you know, again, here we go. Like how does that, is that specifically about Jesus? Well, no. Can that make us think about the heart that Jesus has? Yes, absolutely. That's the kind of heart our heavenly father has. That's the kind of heart that Jesus has. And that's what we need to show people. Mm -hmm. We have to show the world that. And so that's the type of things we're doing when we're serving other people. Yeah. We're serving exactly the way mm -hmm. Christ served us. We also do our Operation Christmas Child boxes through our Awana ministry. Yeah. That's another way that to give gifts and to share the gospel. I mean, find ways through your church to really get into giving and serving and sharing the love of Christ. You know, people's hearts are open this time of year mm -hmm. and they are more willing to hear about your faith and hear about Jesus. And some of these things can be, can be open door, can help open those doors. And so make sure to engage in just giving gifts. Maybe it's, maybe it's you want to bake cookies and pass them out to your neighbors it, it, and yeah, share that the would, love that of would Christ mean so much. It's just showing people that you care. <laughs> right. And that's what, you know, God didn't have to think about this. God did not have to, come into the world. Jesus right. didn't have to do anything. Um, he could have, he could have made it to where we live forever. He could have, you know, quote, saved us without God being with us. But the point is that God cares and he loves us so much that he sent the son into Amen. the world. And so we've got to show the world that we care and it can be cookies. That's right. It can be stuff so simple, but if we're not even trying, then we will miss those opportunities. Yep. So we as a church want to encourage uh, people to think about Jesus, focus yeah. on him. His birth is so important. It's important to uh, our faith. It's important historically and traditionally. Yeah. And so we'll talk more next week about 
how the families can really take these traditions and make them a part and, and how they can really focus around Jesus for the holidays. But, yeah. you know, I'm just so happy we're in a church that uh, really teaches the Bible and teaches the, the true meaning behind right. Christmas. So. Yeah, we're not going to sacrifice the, the truth of Scripture for anything, right. um, but we will, we will celebrate the truth of Scripture right. uh, the, the way that we, the best way that we can. Amen. So, All right. So, thanks we gotta, for joining us. Yeah, outro us. Jingle bells. Bye jingle bye, bells. Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see you next time. See you next time. Through the snow in a one horse open sleigh over the fields we go. Le- Did you do all the laughing all the way? <laughs> <laughs> I was I was waiting for you to keep going. <laughs> My most favorite part.